But next is uh, Magda. Magda was a postdoc in the ADU maybe uh, 10 years ago. She's now associate professor at the University of Gdansk in uh, Poland. And um, she spent lockdown in hell. And uh, <laughs> Magda, can you tell us about spending lockdown in hell? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'll try to tell you how is it to be in hell if I manage to share my screen. Okay, let me try that. Um, yeah, it's busy loading. Okay. Um, okay, do you see my screen, my PowerPoint yeah, we presentation? Can see the PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay, great. And yeah, so a couple of words about how is it to be in hell. Actually, hell is a lovely place. It's a peninsula um, at the coast of the of the Balt Baltic coast of Gdańsk in Poland, and this is where I had the privilege to spend my lockdown, uh, because it just happened that I left South Africa. I was actually visiting Les and Barberspan in February, March, and fourth March, which was the first case, first case of COVID. Uh, identified in South Africa. I was on the flight and we were already, me and my two students that uh, were visiting South Africa with me, we started getting messages that COVID is attacking, you know, Europe. By the time we got to Poland, Poland also had the first case of COVID. So fortunately, you know, we came that very day to Poland. A week later, we would have been locked down in South Africa which then probably we could turn in some in utility, into some utility, but this would then cause lots of problems in Poland then. But we made it just on time. And three days after we touched the ground in Poland, the university was closed and, you know, then uh, the factories were closed. People were asked to stay at home, which was a bit scary because it was just two weeks before our usual start of the field season. Okay. Now, so this is how the situation was, but I first want to show you more or less where hell is. If you wanted to go to hell yourself or visit me in hell, then this is where hell is. So if we are looking at Europe and Africa and you see the migration routes, roughly, you know, the southwestern migration route of birds between uh, Africa and Europe and the southwestern and the southeastern route, um, the Baltic coast, the Polish coast is exactly on the crossroads. Uh, so we've got a population that use both migration flyways and we've got some percentage of the birds that actually spend um, our winter, but your summer in South Africa. And then about this time, about March to May, they'll be returning to the north and then passing through the Polish coast on their way to the north to their breeding grounds. Um, so now this square here would be Poland, my home country, and hell is at the very north of Poland, if you ever wanted to find it. And then if you enlarge that area, it's the Bay of, Bay of Gdańsk. Uh, here a little bit at the south, there is a city of Gdańsk where I live and work there at the university. And our team, the Bird Migration Research Station, is based at the University of Gdańsk. But during the seasons of migration, of bird migrations, we set up sort of temporary ringing uh, camp, which is temporary, but it's for up to three months at the, at the time, at the very coast, in a places that have been identified previously as the places of high concentration of uh, migrants on migration. This is where we set up our ringing. And this has been a monitoring scheme launched in 19. 61 by my supervisor, supervisor of my PhD, Professor Przemysław Bus, and now he's retired. A younger team took over, but then Operation Baltic goes on every spring and every autumn over the last 60 years. We are actually in the 60th anniversary year of the Operation Baltic, our research program. And, you know, this spring we were faced with the risk that, you know, in the 60th I will not be able to carry on the monitoring, which was like a serious challenge. But fortunately, we had like two weeks, you know, during the lockdown to work out how will we play it. 
and normally we would open two stations. The other one uh, more to the west, about 200 kilometers west from Gdańsk. We didn't dare to open that one because we were afraid of restrictions on traveling. But we thought that within our own province, only 70 kilometers away from the city of Gdańsk, we will be allowed to travel. So we decided to start to set up the ringing station as usually with the support of our um, faculty management. We had all the paperwork. I was traveling with three permits in my handbag in, in case anyone asks me why am I traveling. Uh, but nobody asked. So yeah, this was a good thing. Um, so what we do at that very location, it's a narrow peninsula as you have seen. It's actually less than one kilometer wide. There is only one forest road uh, along the whole peninsula. And uh, it's a strip of coastal forest, which is an attractive stopover place for the migrants that are flying in the eastern direction, northeastern direction. It's actually a leading line for them. Plus, you know, if they are tired, they can sit in that forest. And this is where the ringing station, Hell, has been set up every spring since uh, 1963. So this is the general look at our ringing camp. We are basically camping. So if you can imagine a kind of scouts camp uh, focused on bird ringing, this is what we are. This is the setup. Now the most important uh, monitoring tool is our mist nets and ringing the birds that are called by mist netting. And uh, it's very standardized, so it's always the same standard period. It must be at least 23rd March till 15th May. On those days, the mist nets should be open. And it's, uh, every year, it's 50 standard mist nets that are open around the ringing station, so that the numbers are more or less comparable for certain species between the years. And also timing of migration is, is comparable. And the ringing goes on every day from dawn to dusk we um every hour we check the mist nets if the weather is bad if it's rain or snow which can still happen at that time that we run around more often then ring the birds take a set of measurements and release them and also that way we are getting quite a lot of ringing recoveries because we are straight on the migration route um, and we are getting lots of ringing recoveries, especially of birds uh, ringed um, elsewhere in Europe, but also sometimes in African countries. Um, so the standard procedure would be to take birds from a mist net and then to bring it to our ringing station, which is in that very camp. And then we ring the bird, take the measurements, and off it goes with a ring. But what stays with us is the set of measurements and this is our treasure. And over those 60 years of the Operation Baldic activity, we've got now over uh, 1 million records, actually records for over 1 million uh, individual birds. And that's altogether about 13 million uh, data cells because then it's about 13 measurements for each individual. So there is a bit of data collected over the 60 years. And now I'm actually in charge of publishing this data, making as good use as we can, uh, especially that it's monitoring data. It's not only, you know, studying birds' migration routes, but it's monitoring, it's comparable from year to year. So you can only imagine that, you know, we were really keen to carry on with that monitoring, even under the threat of the virus, especially after hearing stories from our past, from our predecessors, like, the communist times didn't kill Operation Baltic. Food shortage and talents for food didn't kill Operation Baltic. The civil war stage in Poland didn't kill Operation Baltic. So we couldn't allow that a silly COVID virus kills Operation Baltic. We had to do something. So then we just took all the uh, precautions, security measures. We comply with the law. We had lots of sanitizers. Fortunately, at that stage, when we set up the camp, people were asked to stay at home, but not in case you have to work. Your work is necessary, you cannot do it any other way, you cannot do it online. So we went along the lines that we cannot actually do field work online, 
So we need to go outdoors. And for that, we got all the possible permits, but we had to shrink the team to the smallest, uh, possible, to the smallest team that would be able to run the station. So, you know, some things have changed this spring. So normally it's a very social exercise. At times, you know, say the smallest team that can run a station is five people. Then you are busy every day. But then, you know, it's an attractive place. So we used to have 10 people, 12 people, some educational events. We are very hospitable. If people come and want to join us for ringing the birds, most welcome. So in the previous years, we had usually up to 10 people as volunteers at the camp. Plus at times there were some environmental education, you know, some outreach events that we hosted. The, the peak was 400 people at once for, uh, for the uh, International Bird Migration Days that falls in mid-May. So this was the previous years. This year we had to limit the team to the absolute minimum, which was five people. So it's those four people and me taking the photos at the time. And then we were running the station within the team of nine most trusted people. I mean, we had to swap a little bit because each of us had some duties in the city. So for example, I was commuting between the city. I would go for two days a week to the city, then to do the online teaching uh, with my students and online lecturing. So Tuesday, Wednesday, I would spend at home, Wednesday evening, I would pack, and then I'll go for the rest of the week until next Tuesday to the field. And everyone, they schedule, we had to play it very carefully so that we don't exceed the limit of six people at the station. Uh, but we do have the coverage for the whole season. We did manage, there were some people like Maciek, this guy who actually came for all three months of the field season and lived there, which helped a lot. Now, usually the environmental education was a typical thing that we run over the weekends or special events. This year, our environmental education shrank to one teenager educated. And this is Milenka. She's a very um, stubborn girl. She was visiting us or typing to us every weekend, asking if she could come to visit us and do some birding with us. We were constantly refusing until the last weekend when we were packing. We thought, now we can let her come. She has been staying at home, not going to school. She wouldn't bring a virus to us. And we are also possibly clean after spending you know, months in a field. So we invited her. She spent two lovely days with us and you know, enjoyed it a lot. I think that's a future ornithologist. So some things have changed, especially the social aspects. But the bird aspect of what we do haven't changed. Birds haven't noticed COVID that much or even noticed it like in positive terms. They were quite numerous. And we had the standard sequence of the migrants that appear through the season. First in March, we start catching uh, migrating short distance migrants that return from their wintering ground somewhere in uh, the southern part of Europe. They return to the north via our coast. So then usually one of the top 10 birds is Goldcrest that we can have a couple of thousand. And it's close, relative, I would say, one in 20 gold crests, one of them will be a fire crest, which is always an attraction. And yeah, and here there are both, well, accidentally are nice males. You can see those little orange tufts here. So both happen to be male. Now, in March, we are having still, you know, other species like bullfinches and little sweet, sweet balls of cotton with a long tail, which is a long tail teat. They also don't go very far. They are actually following the Baltic coast, going to Estonia, Latvia, and then they stay for breeding somewhere in the Finnish forests or Swedish forests. So we had a little influx of those. Then it turns to April, then we start seeing um, medium distance migrants. So those that actually come from, from Africa, but uh, rather north of Sahara. So black caps, red stars, and this kind of nice birds. Um, and a couple of birds from, that go for migration as far as uh, Central Africa. And here there is a little movie. And I think you should be 
able to recognize the typical feature of a night gel, which is this big frog mouth. So all night gels do the same, just open the mouth as, as big as they can. Uh, so we had a couple of those. Um, the habitat is good for them. It's a dry um, pine forest. So that's ideal habitats for night jars on migration. Uh, there is lots of woodland. So woodland birds as woodpeckers, rhinecks, um, also stop over in our place. And this is the movie that shows why rhinec is called rhinec. Okay, so there were, you know, the most interesting birds and then May. Um, this is when long dis longest distance migrants start arriving. The migrants from um, uh, south of Sahara, like from Central Africa, East Africa and Southeast Africa, like garden warblers, or willow warblers. I wouldn't be surprised if those two did visit hell, did came to hell straight from South Africa. Actually, we are now writing a second paper with less on migrations of willow warblers between Africa and our Baltic coast and it turns out to be um, responding uh, to climate changes in, in Africa um, in terms of what we see in the Baltic Sea. So you know some things never changed, the sequence of the species was as usual, the numbers were pretty good, this is one of the latest migrants that we usually have, migrant from India, scarlet rose finch, um, and then we had to close on um, mid-May. So altogether, uh, 2020, despite all the COVID and all the lockdown, was not a bad field season. It was actually the 21st season among 57 springs that we had in hell. And we had over 4,000 birds of 56 species. And it wasn't um, human dependent. I mean, with, within a team of five people at the time, we managed to do the work that normally we would do in 10 uh, people's team. We just had to work faster. But, but the birds didn't notice it. We had the usual top 10 uh, with Robin um, coming in really good numbers, some trash, trashes and chaffinches, and this is the other heroes of this year's spring. Um, so basically answering Les's question, what was it like doing bird ringing in hell? How was it in hell during lockdown? Hell wasn't hell, it was actually heaven. Uh, we were able to camp outdoors, which was forbidden for most of normal citizens. We saw spring developing, you know, first days of the ringing camp, we still had snow on the tents and then we could see like all the flowers blooming, uh, then all the um, you know, trees turning green. We saw a swarm of insects that bring birds there and we saw lots of migrants. So actually we didn't suffer a lot and we actually appreciated being allowed to carry on with our uh, ringing. We actually had absolutely no problem with any local security guards, they knew about us, they supported it. We just had to wear masks while checking the mist nets. But actually this season was much more quiet, there wasn't that many tourists um, as usually. So we felt we've got help and insula for, our help, for ourselves. So it was really heaven. Um, yeah, so this is it. I don't know, and you must remember you are now in South Africa in winter. We, we have been through spring now turning to summer. So it's actually the prime season to be in the field and watch migrants. So this is what I did during lockdown. Well, thank you.